Hi, welcome to Digging for Truth, sponsored by the Associates for Biblical Research. I'm your host, Henry Smith, and on Digging for Truth, we explore the world of archaeology and the Bible. My colleague Brian Wendell's here today to talk about the Persian king Xerxes and his historicity and relationship to the books of Esther and Ezra. Brian, welcome back to Digging for Truth. Good to see you, man. It's good to be back with you, Henry. Right. It's an honor always to get the invite and join you and talk about kings and people from Scripture, and in this case, Xerxes the Great. Now, when we say Xerxes, another great king, you know, they like to call themselves great, like Cyrus the Great. Uh, um, but uh, anybody familiar with uh, Esther and Ezra might, might say, no, wait a minute, I don't know that name. Um, so let's let's uh, jump right into that and address that issue right up right up front. Who who is this guy? Sounds good. Yeah, if you look up Xerxes in a in a commentary, you won't find that um, in uh, in scripture. Well, first of all, Xerxes was his is his Greek name. That's the name that he's best known by. But that wasn't his Persian name. His his Persian name, and and you'll forgive me, my old Persian's a little rusty here, but um, <laughs> his his Persian was uh, Kassarison. And in Akkadian, he was known as Asiersu, and in Hebrew, Hajuerus. And so um, when we say Hajuerus, oh, okay, that makes sense now, because that was the king who was Esther's husband in the book of Esther. Now, there, I should mention that there was a bit of a misidentification at one time in history, uh, particularly with the variant reading of the Septuagint and, um, and Josephus and the Jewish Midrash. They, they suggested that Ahasuerus was Artaxerxes. But when you read the book of Ezra, Ezra chapter 4 gives a sequence of Persian kings. It's clear that Ahasuerus was the son of Darius and, and, his, and the predecessor to Artaxerxes. And so um, Edward Yamuchi, who is a scholar who wrote the book Persia and the Bible says, there is no doubt that Ahasuerus was Xerxes, the son of Darius I. So this, put, this is putting us uh, in the context of uh, 5th century BC, of this period of time, Ezra and the book of Esther. Uh, before we start relating to the biblical text, uh, let's talk about the historical material. I mean, the, the thing that's great about this time period is we have such an embarrassment of riches, uh, you know, because it's just closer to our time. But let's, let's talk about that a little bit. What do we know about uh, King Xerxes? Well, you're right. We have lots of inscriptions, Persian inscriptions and, and other inscriptions that tell us a little bit about the history of that period. Xerxes ascended the throne when his father Darius died in 486 BC, and um, his, his ascension is described in the harem inscription, which was discovered uh, in the palace of the Persian capital of Persepolis. In it, Xerxes says, Darius had other sons, but thus was has uh, Ahur Mazda's desire, that was their god, the Persian god, uh, my father Darius made me the greatest after him. And when my father Darius went away from the throne by the grace of Ahur Mazda, I became king on my father's throne. When I became king, I did that much that was excellent. And so we call him Xerxes the Great. Ironically, what Xerxes is probably best known for is his failed invasion of Greece and uh, the Persian-Greek Wars. And so he did win the Battle of Thermopylae, very famous battle, but he ended up uh, losing the war. And in seven, 479 BC, he returned uh, to Persia defeated. Okay, so that gives us a little bit of context. That's an uh, awesome inscription that we showed up there on the screen. Very clear, e easy for scholars to translate, and very insightful in terms of this time period. Now, evangelical scholars have suggested that what's known about him is fits very well with the chronology that's laid out in the book of Ex Esther. Excuse me. Could you uh, elaborate on that a little bit for the audience? Sure. The book of Esther begins with these words. Now, in the days of Ahasuerus, the Ahasuerus, who reigned from India to Ethiopia over 127 provinces, in those days when King Ahasuerus sat on his royal throne in Susa, the citadel, in the third year of his reign, he gave a feast for all his officials and servants. And so we know this is speaking of an event that took place in the life of Xerxes. And many scholars have pointed out that the chronology of what we know of Xerxes' life and his campaign against the Greeks in particular aligns very nicely with the book of Esther. Uh, for example, this great feast that he threw in his third year was likely 
part of the planning where he invited all of his nobles and his vassal kings into the kingdom um, to discuss his invasion of Greece. And a scholar William Shea noted, with good reason, it has been suggested that the 180-day banquet in Xerxes' third year, referred to in Esther 1, 1 to 3, was connected with the laying of plans for that Greek campaign. The presence of the army in the Masoretic text, or the officers of the army in the Septuagint in Susa at that time, verse 3, lends some support to the suggestion. Um, Herodotus, incidentally, devotes a dozen lengthy paragraphs to Xerxes' discussion with his nobles and generals, describing um, how to carry out the campaign against Greece. And then we have this four-year window in the book of um, in the book of Esther after Queen Vashti is deposed. It's in his seventh year that Queen Esther um, is is made queen. And those four years match the four-year campaign that Xerxes had when he went. Um, to Greece. And Herodotus records that Xerxes, after his failed campaign in Greece, returned specifically to Susa after um, his invasion. Now, what's really interesting is that, um, that Herodotus breaks off his discussion about Xerxes after year seven. And not much is known from Herodotus about Xerxes or his wives after year seven, which happens to be the precise time where most of the book of Esther takes place. And so um, it's very interesting to, to see that as we, we put the two together. But what yeah. we see is that they align very nicely. Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, the, the obvious thing to say off the bat would be, uh, but, but again, this is important to emphasize, uh, you know, these are not just religious texts, although the Bible is a religious text. It's putting the events of Esther right in a historical context in a very clear and concrete way. Now, we have about a minute left in the segment. Maybe you could comment on that a little bit more just to emphasize that point. Yeah, one of the things I notice is that people seem to um, want to dismiss the Bible merely as a religious text, um, as if in some way it can't both be a religious text and a historical text. It's almost like they think those two things are mutually exclusive and there's some dichotomy there. And, th and that's not the case at all. Something can be a religious text and can be a, um, a historical text. I mean, when you look at that first verse and you look at all of the historical markers from the book of Esther that are in there, it's very clear that this is being portrayed not as some fanciful court tale, as some people have suggested, but is being portrayed as actual verifiable historical data that's there. Yeah, we see an analogy in the New Testament and particularly in the Gospel of Luke where he places the birth, the birth narrative of Jesus is placed right in a historical context with a whole bunch of markers uh, related to the chronology of the birth of Jesus. Well, friends, uh, we're here with Brian Wendell. We're talking about King Xerxes and we'll be right back. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archeological field work and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm your host, Henry Smith. I'm here with Brian Wendell, and we're talking about King Xerxes. Now, um, Brian, let's talk about uh, placing him in the historical context as it relates to the palace at Susa and that relationship with the book of Esther. Please tell the audience about that. It's very interesting. Sure. The palace at Susa was actually built by King Darius, uh, Xerxes' father. And then Xerxes lived there. It was the winter palace of the Persian uh, kings of the Achaemenid Empire. And, and the remains of the palace can actually be seen um, in modern day Iran from Google Earth. And this is a Google Earth image uh, that I, I screen captured. I, I like exploring things from Google Earth and you can actually see it. And excavations of this palace at Susa have revealed some of the specific places within the palace that are mentioned in the book of Esther, the audience hall 
uh, or the court of gardens where Xerxes hosted his feast, the outer courtyard where Haman was waiting to speak to the king in Esther 6, the inner court where Queen Esther stood as she waited to approach um, the king in Esther 5, the throne room, of course, where Esther and Xerxes meet when she presents her request. All of these things have been identified um, in the excavations that are there. In fact, the descriptions in the book of Esther so perfectly match the um, what is known from archaeology of the palace at Susa that scholars have suggested that the book of Esther must have been written by someone who was intimately familiar with that palace and had been there. Now, the French archaeologist Jean Perrot was the world's foremost expert on the palace at Susa. He was the one who led the excavations there, the director of excavations for over a decade. And before his death in 2012, uh, he said this, one today rereads with a renewed interest the book of Esther, whose detailed descriptions of the interior disposition of the palace of Xerxes is now in excellent accord with archaeological reality. Now, people often want to know, is there any evidence, um, any inscriptions that mention Queen Esther? Um, and the answer is no, we don't have any inscriptions. Remember, um, most of what we know from this time period is, is just a blank slate because Herodotus, our prime source, doesn't discuss things after year seven as it relates to his queens. Uh, but when we look at the palace of Xerxes, when we look at the other details, um, the, the cultural details, for example, that are in the book of Esther, what we see is that they line up time and time again with what we know about Persian history of that period. Yeah, the level of corroboration here is extraordinarily high. I mean, it's, it's actually quite remarkable. I mean, it's almost the equivalent of a photograph uh, without a photograph. I mean, it, I mean it's, that, it's that close. So why deny the historicity of Esther when you have all this other historical data around it correct? I mean, it just, it just wouldn't make sense to do that. Um, let's shift a little bit. Uh, let's talk about reliefs uh, for, new, for new audience members. Tell them maybe quickly what a relief is and then describe those related to Xerxes. Sure. A simplified way to describe it is a relief is a carving, usually on rock, um, three-dimensional of, uh, of something, some scene. And of course, whenever we talk about uh, biblical characters, people often want to know, do we have a picture of them? And um, the, the short answer is yes. There's a very famous um, relief from uh, Persepolis. And uh, Persepolis was one of the other Persian capital cities. It's located in southwestern region of modern-day Iran. It's one of the best preserved royal cities in the ancient world. And Darius constructed the fortifications and central buildings, and he began the Apadana, that's the, the audience hall, and he began the treasury. And then Xerxes came along and uh, finished everything up. He completed the Apadana, completed the treasury. The treasury, of course, um, we believe is where they, they housed a lot of their wealth. And within the treasury, um, there is this um, big relief, and on uh, a throne is seated a king uh, holding a flower and, a, and, a, and a, um, a staff. Those are the common ways that kings in antiquity in the ancient Near East were depicted. And behind him stands the crown prince. Now, scholars uh, almost unanimously identify the king on the throne as King Darius. And so the figure standing behind him, the crown prince, would be King Xerxes or Ahasuerus, the husband of Queen Esther from the Bible. Now, uh, when I was joking a little bit about the photograph, uh, these reliefs are, in effect, uh, they would have scribes or, 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 or artists, perhaps, is what you might call them, actually there. They were hired by the king's court. And we see this, like, at the Battle of Lachish, for example. I mean, uh, you know, uh, Mike Hazel, archaeologist, said, you know, we can, we can actually figure out where he was standing when he was depicting the battle that are in the, uh, that's, uh, that's depicted in the reliefs from the Sennacherib's palace. But I, I don't want to digress there too much, just the point of uh, maybe you can comment on, you know, again, here we have concrete history, the equivalent of a photograph. Sure, and I think your point about the accuracy of um, some of the things that are recorded. Now, obviously, when when uh, kings from the ancient Near East boasted about things, um, you sometimes had to take that with a grain of salt and you, yes. you compare it with what's written elsewhere. But when it comes to reliefs, I know even, um, even from Assyrian reliefs, for example, we have um, reliefs of um, scribes and artists who are, who are, um, who are, 
depicting other scribes and artists who are depicting what's there. And so we know that um, they did strive with their with their reliefs to be accurate. And so I think we have a good um, a good illustration of what Xerxes looked like. And um, you know, so when you combine these these all these different pieces of data together, it really makes strong with the palace and now with this. Now in our next segment, Brian, we wanted to start talking about inscriptions. Maybe about, take about a minute here and sort of like introduce, give the audience a little flavor of what we're gonna talk about in our next segment. And then when we get there, we'll talk about it more. Sure. Well, one of the things that excites archaeologists and, and scholars of the Bible is when we have inscriptions that name and describe uh, either events that are biblical events or uh, people who are biblical people. And being a king, a famous king, Xerxes, um, there are numerous inscriptions that he left, um, some of which are pretty much just copies, almost word for word, of inscriptions his father left. It seems to be kind of the standard thing you would say if you were a king. But others uh, delve a little deeper and describe um, some of the things that were happening uh, at that time in the empire. And so we're going to discuss those in our next segment. Oh, that'll be great. Well, friends, thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth, where we explore the history of the Bible and related to the world of archaeology. And if you've watched our program, uh, maybe perhaps numerous times, or if you're new to the program, you'll discover how reliable the biblical text is as it relates to history. With that word, we'll be right back after this message. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research. Written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint, Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must-read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Digging for Truth is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV, positively different television. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm here with Brian Wendell. We're talking about King Xerxes and his relationship to the books of Ezra and Esther. Now, Brian, uh, we were talking about inscriptions. We uh, just sort of gave a general sketch of that before the end of our last segment. Let's pick it up there, Brian. Uh, what do we have? What are the goods the, that we got as it relates to inscriptions about this king? Well, there are some good inscriptions from Xerxes and some that I find a little humorous. Um, now, Xerxes, like many of the ancient kings, most of the ancient kings, described himself in glowing terms. In fact, uh, many of them are word for word adoptions, as we've noted from his father. Um, one of my favorites is, uh, is an inscription from Persepolis, and this is what he says. Xerxes says, I am not hot tempered. Whatever befalls me in battle, I hold firmly. I am ruling firmly my own will, the man who is cooperative according to his cooperation, thus I rewarded him, who does harm him according to the harm I punish. Now this is a virtual um, copy of his father's inscription, but what I find interesting about that is when you read the book of Esther, when in that scene where Esther reveals that, that the wicked uh, Haman has, has, um, is, is, is out to kill her people and, and, and um, Xerxes leaves and then he comes back in and he sees Haman falling on Esther and he just loses it, right? And it, so I, I, I read that and then we have this inscription, I am not hot tempered. Um, <laughs> it's, it's just kind of a, a funny inscription to that me. Uh, one of the most important inscriptions from his reign is the Davia inscription. And in this one, we hear about the extent of the kingdom that he ruled. Um, he says this, by the grace of Ahura Mazda, that's the Persian uh, god, um, Persian creator god. These are the countries which I was king of uh, apart from Persia. I had lordship over them. They bore me tribute. What was said to them by me, that they did. My law, that held them. And he goes on. He talks about Media and Elam and Parthia and Bactria. And then he, he mentions um, India and Cappadocia and all of these places. Um, and that's important because that lines up with what we read about in the book of Esther, um, the, this great king who ruled this massive empire. And generally, it agrees there. There's a, a humorous inscription, I find anyways, uh, that Xerxes left um, near Lake Van. 
And uh, the text is recorded in Persian and Babylonian. It's called the Van Inscription. And in it, Xerxes uh, says a lot of things. But one of the things he says is, King Darius, my father, by the grace of Ahura Mazda, built much that was good. And he gave orders to dig this niche out because he did not make an inscription. I ordered an inscription to be made. Basically, he declares, my dad left this space blank, so I'm filling it with something. And so he leaves this little inscription for us there. And finally, we have the royal tombs uh, of the Achaemenid uh, kings. Um, the king, the tomb of King Darius um, is the only one we can really conclusively identify based on an inscription. But then there are, are three others that we believe are the, um, the tombs of the successor kings. Um, and this is the tomb that we believe is the tomb of King Xerxes. All of them were made in this uh, cross-shaped fashion. And when Xerxes was assassinated by the captain of his bodyguard, um, he was likely buried here, even though there are no inscriptions on this particular tomb. So in summary, when we look at all of the inscriptions from Xerxes, we learn the extent of his kingdom, which generally lines up with the uh, description in the book of Esther, in which he says that he reigned from India to Ethiopia. We see those kinds of things in his inscriptions, and we even get a little bit of a colorful stuff in there that describes, at least from his perspective, what he was like. Yeah, I like the thing. I, I'm not hot tempered, uh, you know. <laughs> Talk about uh, the, uh, the, hu the the human condition of uh, uh, denial or, or self-deception is very interesting. You know, another thing that occurred to me here too, and this seemed maybe self-evident, but we could maybe talk about this for a few moments, is the, the need or the propensity to record in history. You know, we have the Chronicles in the, in the Old Testament, the, the inspired text, but Boy, all across the world, in all kinds of cultures, in no matter what, there's this need to record things. Even even in something as malignant as you know Nazi Germany, they had to record all the horrific stuff that they were doing. Uh, so even in that, we find documented records. It's really extraordinary. Maybe comment on on just that that universal impulse, if you would. Yeah, people feel the need to um, leave some record of what they've done, or they feel the need to record what others have done. And um, part of this may be for posterity, part of it is for clarification. And what's really interesting when we look at ancient texts outside of the Bible is the different ways you look at them. For example, Egyptian writings, often if they're left by um, the great pharaohs of Egypt, you, you kind of sometimes question how much of that is accurate history. Um, scholars, I uh, just got a new book in the mail uh, by Mordecai Kogan uh, called The Raging Torrent about Assyrian inscriptions. And in it, he says, you, you can't always trust everything that Assyrian kings claimed to have done. But then you have other writings like the Babylonian Chronicles, which seem to be far more um, accurate. There's no aggrandizing of kings. It's just a simple recorded history. And that seems to be what we see in Scripture, too. We see this recorded history. And think of the Kings and Chronicles. Not every king in, uh, who's listed in the Kings and Chronicles is listed in a positive light yeah. there. And so it tends to be more accurate recorded history that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I appreciate your insights on that. Again, I, it just seems to be a, a universal part of human culture. Now, Brian, we have about a minute and a half left to sum up, uh, you know, the evidence from this king. And, and once again, you know, after all these episodes of Digging for Truth, we keep saying the same message. You can trust the Bible. It's true. Um, once we identify correctly who Ahasuerus was, that he was Xerxes, the in the Greek, we call him Xerxes, uh, Xerxes the Great, the king of the Persian Empire, we see how all of these different things um, line up. Um, archaeology tells us that Xerxes was a great king, if greatness is defined by wealth and power, um, which generally lines up with what we see in um, in Scripture. Now, it's interesting that after his failed invasion of Greece, um, the Persian Empire goes on a, on a steady decline after that. From a, from a biblical point of view, what archaeology does is it provides the cultural background for us by which we can understand some of the things in the book of Esther, um, and we see how it aligns and affirms the things that are in the book of Esther. I, I mean, it's become a, a very popular thing in the modern world to, to dismiss Esther as just a fanciful court tale. We know that in antiquity there were court tales that were not 
true history. Right. They were just fanciful tales written about the court. And some have suggested that this is what the book of Esther is. However, um, the stuff that is in Esther, the details are so specific and line up so much with archaeology that that I don't believe that it could have been written hundreds of years later as just this as this court tale. And so simply put, the Xerxes of Scripture, Ahasuerus, and the Xerxes of history are one and the same. And this is something that we should take great comfort in, because I believe that if you can trust what the Bible says historically, and I believe you can, then I believe that you can trust its message spiritually, the message of Jesus coming to earth to save people from their sins, that this is true. I mean, the whole gospel is rooted in history. And and this is an important thing for us to understand. We, we say it over and over again, and we come to it again at the end of this show. You can trust the scriptures. Amen to that, brother. Thank you for joining us again, Brian. And friends, thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth. We hope you have a great day.